Start. Hey, it's Lemon. Welcome to the Backlogs. Back in January, I made a video about one of the worst spells in Dark Souls 2, Immolation. And it works exactly like it says on the tin. You set yourself on fire, and then invade everyone else's personal space, hoping that the flames are hot enough to do damage to everyone around you. It's terrible, it was the hardest run I've ever done, and I don't recommend it. Which is why today, I'm doing it all over again. But this time, in Dark Souls 1. How you ask? Why, with the power of Jesus, of course. Meaty Jesus, that is. If you haven't given his channel a peek, you definitely should. He's done some pretty wild challenge runs, up to and including the one-shot challenge I held earlier this year. Yes, I'm still working on it, shut up, there's five terabytes of footage to look through. But in any case, today's the day we find out. Can you beat Dark Souls 1 with only immolation? So, let's talk about what it is we're doing here. The Immolation mod works very similarly to how it does in Dark Souls 2. Cast the spell, set self on fire, hug enemies to death before you burn to a crisp yourself. Behold, Immolation, the bane of my existence. Rather than a spell, Immolation is an item this go around, since unlike Dark Souls 2, we can't just pop consumables to give ourselves unlimited casts. So this was about as good a workaround as we could think of. When cast, we take a consistent amount of damage every second. There's no way to turn it off, no way to diminish the damage, and no way to increase the damage given to enemies. Just the way Miyazaki intended. So yeah, that's the damage we're working with today. I crave death. Speaking of death, today's video is- Oh my god, are you okay? Huh? Oh, yeah, no, I'm fine. Should- should I call someone? Nah, this is just my life now. I'll get used to it. Uh, alright. Anyway, today's video is sponsored by Wanted Dead. Wanted Dead is a cyberpunk hack and slash action game that might as well be a love letter to the cult classic games of the PS3 and Xbox 360 era. You'll play as Detective Stone, the detective with a heart of gold and a katana of steel. Dice your way through enemies while simultaneously unleashing your inner gunkata with pistols, machine guns, grenade launchers, and, uh, karaoke? Uh, customize your experience by modding out your favorite weapons, changing up your character with new abilities from several skill trees, and- Ooh, timeout, is that a claw game? You what? Stupid piece of junk! Blow off steam by murdering your way through countless enemies, and take on larger-than-life bosses that'll make you wonder, why are there so many cats in the police station? No, seriously, why are there more than zero cats in here? What is all this? So, if that sounds like a good time to you, you can use my link below to play Wanted Dead, the most bizarre game of 2023. By the way, now is the best time to play Wanted Dead, as the game is currently not 30%, not 40%, but up to 60% off, the biggest discount yet. You can find it on Steam, Epic Game Store, PS4 and 5, as well as Xbox One, Series X, and Series S. The sale will be available until November 28th on Steam, November 30th on Xbox, and December 20th on PlayStation. You, uh, you're still on fire. Yeah, I know. Do, do you want some water? I mean, I wouldn't say no- <laughs> Oh wait, that was gasoline. Wait, why do I have gasoline in a bucket? So, let's get this run started, shall we? I've picked the Knight class, because it has the most HP, and after a short talk with Oscar, we now have the one and only thing keeping me from dying every time I cast this spell. Cheers, Chief. Don't you dare go hollow. Alright, let's see what we're dealing with here. Well, it's not great damage, but it's certainly not punching things to death with your fist levels of bad either. Of course, you aren't constantly on fire when you try to do a fist-only build, so who really can say? We arrive at Firelink Shrine, where I pump all my points into vitality, for obvious reasons, then make a corpse run down into New Londo to get the Firekeeper's soul. Because if there's one thing I've learned from doing this run in Dark Souls 2, it's that we need two things. A large health bar, and ways to regain that health bar quickly. And with an Estus plus one in our pocket, maybe we'll have a chance. I do a little grinding on the Undead Berg Hollows, mostly to get a few more levels in vitality, but also to test out the spell's effectiveness against different enemy types. As expected, the damage isn't good, but it does ignore shields, so that's something at least. I make my way to the Taurus Demon, where we instantly have another problem. Hello boys, you guys gonna be a pain in my kidneys today? <laughs> Boy howdy, can't wait. I drag the Taurus Demon over to say hello, and immediately take two crossbow bolts to the face for my efforts. A strong start. Looks like the damage is about the same as the Asylum Demon, which means I'm gonna need at least three Estus Flasks to finish the job. But more importantly, I'm gonna have to relearn the timing of immolation. Namely, how long it lasts, how much damage it does to me, and how long it takes to chug an Estus Flask. Round 2 starts a lot better, with Taurus Demon killing the Crossbowman with ease. And, uh, then me. I mean, at least he's consistent. Alright, third time's a charm. Immolation on, shields up, Estus chugged at the appropriate times, and... Oh, that's not good. Well, good news, bad news. The good news is that we have unlimited casts of Immolation, 
so we can just turn our flames back on, which means Taurus Demon goes down, and we can move on. The bad news is that we don't have enough Estus to stay alive until Immolation stops. So yeah, can't wait for that to be a problem throughout the run. Only one way to solve that issue, more health. God, it feels weird being this healthy. I scurry my way to the Undead Parish, steal myself another Firekeeper's Soul, then immediately use it to give myself an Estus plus two. Solutions, we got them. And with 10 Estus and a Dream, I figure we might as well push ahead. Time for the Gargoyles. Well, the damage is certainly decent, but there's that looming problem of there being, you know, two of them. I try my best to scurry over to the second one and take care of the problem early, but the first Gargoyle didn't like being ignored and felt like he had to join the fun. Turns out adding more fire to fire is absolutely a thing. Who knew? All right, let's try this again. We start by whittling down the first gargoyle, and when the second gargoyle makes his appearance, we make a beeline for him and give him some love as well. While both gargoyles can breathe fire, the second one is much more likely to use it. And considering my shield can't really withstand fire coming from both sides, he's gotta go. It's a bit closer than I'd like, but the second garg goes down with a little convincing. After that, this fight is essentially over. Another boss down. So far so good. Back at Firelink Shrine, our favorite pal Lotrek seems to have escaped his cell. Unfortunately for him, I really need my Firekeeper not to be dead, so he's gotta go. Huh, well this is awkward. I guess the NPCs have no idea how to handle damage over time effects. Interesting. I wonder if they're like that for other spells, like Poison Mist. Well, in any case, after seven Estus Flasks worth of immolation damage, Lutrek finally realizes that he's on fire and is kind enough to give me his ring and a few humanities before kicking the bucket. Ooh, baby, that's a lot of health and stamina. Look at this beefcake. Who is he? Well, might as well put all that new vitality to work. Time for the Capra Demon. Weirdly, Immolation actually trivializes the hardest part of this fight, since it takes the one strength that dogs have and turns it against them. They can pin me up against the wall all they like, but they can't do it for long. After that, it's just a matter of hugging the Capra and... Uh, cut the camera? Carl, cut the camera. All right, first try, let's go. Such an easy game. What? No, no, I was always human, what are you talking about? With my health sitting at a whopping 32 points, it's time we found ourselves something a bit more challenging. Bring on the baby shark. All right, you beastie, time to meet your, what, uh, what am I looking at here? Is, is that damage? No, seriously, I can't tell, is that damage? All right, so maybe the gaping dragon was a bit ambitious. I don't care how you slice it, there's no way that 10 Estus was going to cut it. It looked like one cast of immolation was doing one health segment of damage, and considering most bosses have about 14 segments in their health bar, and healing from immolation takes about two Estus, yeah, no, that math doesn't add up. Now we could start popping humanity to heal ourselves, but considering we're only at the gaping dragon, I have a feeling we're gonna need those later. Besides, Meaty Jesus actually added ways we could improve our build into the game, if we can reach it. Looks like now's as good a time as any. I get my Estus flask up to plus three, then head into the forest to go fight the butterfly. The beginning of the fight is easy enough, since we just have to treat it like any other fight, but when it's coming in for its nibbles, it's time to light up. Let's see how well you burn, you... Uh-oh. So yeah, while the damage is technically more than the Gaping Dragon, the butterfly can play keep away for about 75% of my spell's duration, which means we're right back to where we started. Right. Desperate times call for desperate measures. I think it's time we paid Tony a visit. <laughs> well, speak of the devil and he shall appear. Hey Tony, any idea where Pinwheel's hiding these days? Fuck you! All right, good talk. I take the shortcut through the catacombs to avoid dealing with any other miscreants, then begin what will probably be the hardest pinwheel fight anyone has ever done. Why, you ask? Well, aside from the absolutely abysmal damage we're doing, it turns out that Immolation does not, in fact, injure pinwheel's clones. So that's fun. Look at this. What am I supposed to do with this? I don't even know which one is the real one anymore. Well, at least we know what we're getting into now. Let's try that again. I've got 10 Estus this time, and at plus three, that should be enough to... <laughs> All right, once more with feeling. This time I make sure to keep the real pinwheel in my sights, and despite the arena filling up with more pinwheels and fireballs than I ever wanted to see, the fight itself isn't too bad. So long as we aren't caught off guard by a random fireball or flamethrower attack, it's just a matter of keeping my health high and slowly burning pinwheel down. It got a little hairy towards the end when pinwheel decided he wanted to bounce around the arena and avoid a good chunk of my damage, to the point where I ran out of Estus flasks, but I had already come this far, and I wasn't about to die to pinwheel a third time. So I did what I promised I wouldn't do, and popped to humanity. Desperate times indeed. But sometimes desperation breeds victory. Hectic and messy, but victory all the same. And with that, we not only gained the right of kindling, which lets me carry up to 20 Estus flasks into battle now, but pinwheel was also kind enough to drop the Mask of the Mother, which, if we're being honest, was probably the best mask he could have dropped for this run. Because if there's one thing this build will always need more of, it's health. Speaking of, time for more vitality. I get a little encouragement from Patches. Thank you. 
Then get to work killing Vince and Nico. It, uh, it goes well. Hey, uh, you might want to watch out for the... Yeah, that. Well, I mean, I did try to warn them. Not my fault they didn't listen. But with them dead, Rhea gives me replenishment. A miracle that slowly regenerates HP. Who needs life gems, am I right? Now, I don't exactly have the faith to cast it yet, but I'm sure Petrus here would be happy to teach me how it works. So do I have to die to cast it, or...? After a little bit of grinding, we make it to 16 faith, and after grabbing a free talisman from below the elevator, we should be good to go. All right, cast immolation, then cast... Uh, I, I said then we cast... Uh-oh. Oh, come on, are you kidding me? All that just for it not to work? Okay, um, how about if we reverse the process? Oh. Oh, hello. All right, now we're cooking with butter. So yeah, work around obtained. If you cast Replenishment before you cast Immolation, you not only gain slow HP regen, but it removes the damage Immolation would do to you, so long as the miracle is active. Oh hey, I got the doll. This means that each cast of Replenishment gives me a full 60 seconds of free damage, which almost sounds broken when you consider what we've been working with up to this point. But let me remind you that in Dark Souls 2 you can carry over 900 healing consumables, with almost every single one of them healing more HP than Replenishment, and all of them healing you faster. So that's a bit depressing. Combine that with our damage, our, our damage, our damage, God's teeth there, now I can see it. And yeah, things are looking a bit bleak for the run. But fear not, dear scholars, for where there's a will, there's a way. And I have a way. Because not only do we have a free two minutes of damage with the butterfly now, but I accidentally found out that we can hit it throughout the fight. See that? That's progress. It's a bit finicky, but it turns out that every now and again, the butterfly's wings get a little too close to me. And when they do, immolation triggers and causes it to take damage. It's only chip damage, and it's not much, but after using all of our casts of replenishment and nine of our ten Estus flasks, we've finally done it. Moonlight Butterfly Destroyed. And for my troubles, a little gift from Meaty Jesus. Eternal Suffering, now in yellow flavor. When I initially presented the idea of modding an immolation to Dark Souls 1, MJ and I both realized that, unlike Dark Souls 2, some bosses in this game are immune to fire damage. And, because we didn't want me to get off the suffer bus too quickly, Jesus was kind enough to create another version of Immolation, which works exactly the same way, but this time, instead of doing fire damage, it does electric. And after a little bit of testing, I've learned a few things. First off, I can stack both Immolations at the same time, which stacks their damage, but does not stack their self-damage. Rather, it just resets the timer. And the fun doesn't stop there. With only one HP in a dream, I make my way to the Cat Covenant Forest, cast some casual insults at the mushroom men to get them away from their treasure, then quickly ninja loot the chest before sprinting off into the distance with my prize. Magic Immolation, the third and final form of my material suffering. And with their powers combined, we dive back into the fray with the gaping dragon. This. This I can work with. Now, while it is beautiful, this does add a few levels of complexity to our situation. First we have to cast Replenishment, then cast each individual Immolation, all while avoiding the boss's attacks. And then we also have to keep a mental timer in our heads on top of it all, making sure not to accidentally reset one of my immolations when replenishment is inactive. Because if we do, we can no longer cast replenishment until the immolation timer is over, meaning we'd take several Estus worth of unavoidable damage. All of that mental math, just so we can do enough damage to kill the gaping dragon. This is fun. I'm having fun. And with our new immolation flavors and strategies in hand, we can finally move forward on the main path. Who's ready for some progress? Please God let there be progress. Being that Quaylag is immune to fire, I could only use two of my three flavors. But while the damage isn't much, there is damage. And even better news, I created a new strategy to push that terrible, terrible damage even further. If I reset all my immolations right before replenishment runs out, the nullifying effect that replenishment has on immolation lasts for the entire duration of the spell, even though the health regen effect is stopped. Which is just a confusing way of saying that I found a way to get an extra minute of self-damage free immolation. And after almost 10 minutes of running in circles while spewing streams of blue and yellow, Quaylag finally gives up. Victory is mine! But with two bells down, it's finally time to get into the second half of the game. Oh, hey, are you Quaylag's sister? Oh my god, I've heard so much about you. I mean, I, I would have if I took the witch ring at the beginning of the game, but yeah, no, she's probably always trying to tell me about you. Uh-oh. Uh, snatch a grab? So with our SS flash boost to plus four, and with my powers combined doing a whopping 34 damage every second, things are looking good. Is it just me or is it a little loud in here? Right, time for Sun's Funhouse. Judging by all the enemies we've fought so far, I have a sneaking suspicion that we aren't going to be able to knock the golem off the cliff this go around. Call it an educated guess. But with the firebomb giant removed from the equation, all this fight is going to take is time and timing. And with what we now know about the way these spells work, 
I'm actually able to get the golem down to less than 25% health on replenishment alone. Which means the five S's I brought with me are almost enough to survive the fight. I guess I could have let myself die and just reclaim the souls later, but sometimes you just need a victory, you know? Just short of hitting the vitality soft cap, and there is another firekeeper just standing here. Eh, better not. She knows where I sleep. I make my way across the scaffolding, helping the painting guardians understand how gravity works as I go, then reveal Gwendolyn's hiding spot for later by using the Dark Moon Seance Ring. And now that I've got a bonfire somewhere in Anne Orlando, I go back to Cat and pass the time with a nice conversation. I think I'm sleeping on the couch tonight. Sleeping arrangements aside, I make my way into Anne Orlando proper to face off against the next big hurdle of the run. Hello, boys. I'd ask you to be gentle, but we both know that's not going to happen. Orsine and Smo present several problems for this particular run. The first and foremost is that they leave very little room for casting my spells. The second is that even with all three spells active, the damage is... not great. And with so much going on in this fight, I'm losing track of my timing and forgetting to look at my health. Which means I get to die from embarrassment today. Neat. After a little testing, I decided that going after Ornstein first is a fool's errand. Since this fight is incredibly hard when you're facing off against both O and S, and Smo has the lesser defense of the two. And once Smo goes down, it just becomes a matter of hugging Ornstein- Huh. I didn't know you could die from embarrassment twice. You know, while I'm here, I might as well grab all of Havel's gear. We definitely can't use it now, but with Vitality soft capped already, you never know. Might come in handy later. <coughs> you know, I'm starting to think this run was a bad idea. Eventually, I decided that wearing stone armor is the way to go. Not because of the defense, though that is helpful, but because of the poise. It's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but every now and again, it lets me keep my positioning or get a cast off despite getting hit. And that could make all the difference. When it comes to phase two, things are much more relaxed. Super Ornstein isn't exactly hard to predict now that he can't hide behind Smo, so as long as I keep my eyes on him and see what it is he's doing, we'll probably be okay. The real struggle is the health. Ornstein is very resistant to our damage, and because we have to whittle down two health bars in this fight, I'm completely spent on replenishment and have to rely on my Estus to carry me through. Thankfully, I knew this fight was going to be difficult, so I made sure to use the Rite of Kindling to give myself 20 Estus. But Ornstein is only down to 25%, and I'm already down to my last 5 or 6 Estus. It's extremely close, but on my very last heal, Ornstein finally buckles under the pressure and does me the service of dying where he stands. And would you look at that, didn't even need to pop a humanity to stay alive at the end of the fight. Well, what is it? I pump my newly earned levels into Faith, for reasons that will be revealed later, then make peace with Guinevere. You may be Lordran's biggest catfish, but I'll need your help this go around. You get to live for now. Using my newfound ability to warp anywhere and everywhere, I upgrade my Estus to plus five, which is as high as it's going to go, then say hi to Gwendolyn. What foolishness. Yeah, I know that now. Where were you when I started the run? Now, we could cast all of our spells and just try to hug Gwendolyn to death while slowly chasing them down the hallway, or we could do something I've never actually done before. Instead of trying to fight Gwendolyn, my actual goal is to beat them to the end of this endless hallway. Because believe it or not, this illusory hallway will eventually end. And I know that because the archway in the distance is starting to get bigger. And sure enough, there it is. The end. With nowhere else to go, Gwendolyn only has about three moves to work with. And because they aren't able to move anymore, this becomes one of the easiest fights in the entire game. Look, you can even dodge their attacks if you time using Immolation right. I don't even have to roll. Well, that was easy. A single cast of Replenishment later, and Gwendolyn is dead. And to think, all it took was an endless amount of patience. Speaking of patience, it's time to play games with Seath. Don't get too excited, I let him win. I kill the prison guard and get the key, accidentally proving that Immolation is better than crossbows, then try to scurry my happy ass past all the squiddies. It goes well. Little known fact, if you angle yourself just right, you can take a shortcut to the bottom. And yes, puncturing your lung is necessary for the skip to work. I'm just as popular at the bottom of the stairs as I am at the top, but at least here my immolation damage can hit multiple targets at once. And, more importantly, once I've cleared out all of my adoring fans, I can grab the only reason I came to this specific level of hell in the first place. Bountiful sunlight. Essentially the same thing as replenishment, this miracle gradually restores HP after casting, at the exact same rate and for the exact same duration. The only difference is that it can heal your friends as well. If I had any! There's just one problem though. You need 36 faith to cast it, and two attunement slots. What's my faith at these days? Oh. Well, that was a nice thought. We might not be able to heal ourselves repeatedly, but that's no reason to be upset. Turn that frown upside down. Hey, wait a minute, that's not an upside down frown, that's a smile! Let's give Seath a go. Turns out, Immolation doesn't work against his crystal, but that doesn't really matter when he's more than happy to destroy it for us. However, we've got a bigger problem. While our damage is about as good as it ever is, the damage we're taking is dangerously strong. The only way to hurt Seath is to stand near him, 
but he's constantly making the area around him a danger zone. Which means that I'm not only racing the clock with immolation, but I also have to find a way to stay close to Seath without taking crystal damage. This might take some planning. Oh god, please no! Woo! You know what? Maybe we should max out our build a bit before we push forward. We're at the point of the game where things get rough even for a normal run, and I'm over here trying to touch everything to death. I think it's time for a training montage. Woo! Man, what a ride. I was worried that things were starting to get a little slow after killing the Royal Sentinels for the 58th time, but then that Batwing Demon almost killed me on run 247, and it was nothing but high-octane thrills after that. Please God, make it stop. Mental distress aside, I've got my levels where I need them. Vitality at 50, Attunement at 14, Faith at 36. The bare minimum requirements. Oh, I also got Havel's Ring and can medium roll now. So that's something. But with our build pretty much complete, it's time to try and push forward again. Might as well start with something easy though. Oh, hey Ceaseless, didn't see you there. Funnily enough, while Ceaseless literally can't fight back, because of the way immolation works, we can't just hit him the usual seven times and knock him down. We have to stand here, waiting, for several real life minutes. It's fine. This is fine. It takes every single one of my four regen miracles, but eventually my pleas for death were answered. I mean, the target was wrong, but at least someone died. After that, I decided to keep things fresh by bouncing over to the painted world, because why the hell not, where Jeremiah decided he would rather die than deal with my tomfoolery. Which, you know, fair. But that means that Jeremiah left us a little gift in the boss arena. Scoot on past Ms. Lady over here, and we can pick up Jeremiah's armor, which, joy of joys, has some really good curse resistance. In the headpiece, anyway. But with that taken care of, we might as well finish the area properly. Much like the other NPCs in the game, Priscilla doesn't seem to recognize that she's being attacked, which means we can do what we've always been unable to do in every other run, and just play with her fluffy tail. What? I'm being productive. And there we go. One more boss on the pile. Who's next? How about Nito? Yeah, sure, why not? Bring on the Bonefather. So, uh, a few notes on this one. First off, fuck you, Tony. You know what you did. Second, man, does Nito sure love to use special attacks. No, seriously, this man must have forgotten he has a sword, because he is doing his AoE blast five or six times in a row, which can be a bit of a problem when you're low on health and have a shield that doesn't block magic damage very well. What's with all the lords being a pain in my spleen today? Well, might as well clean up the only other loose ends I've got. Hey, Stray, what do you say? For reasons that should be abundantly clear right about now, I've been holding off on fighting the Stray Demon for as long as I can, because while our emulation can do fire, lightning, and magic damage, Stray is weak to none of them which means it takes all four casts of my regen miracles and all but two of my Estus to finish the fight. Ten full minutes of alternating between standing still and running away screaming, all while simultaneously counting to 60 out loud. And I wonder why my parents don't understand my job. Well hey, if we can kill the stray demon, then we can probably kill the demon fire sage, right? And the answer is, yes. Yes we can. In fact, the fight is eerily similar. All of my regen miracles spent, with only two Estus remaining by the end. It's almost as if they copied and pasted the stray demon. Hey, wait a minute! But with the third and final Asylum Demon copy destroyed, it's time for something completely different. Y'all like bugs? This fight is... bad. Not because it's hard, mind you, but because the AI refuses to play properly. I have been literally dodging back and forth for almost a minute now. He just refuses to do a different attack. Eventually, I decided enough was enough and ran to the right side of the arena, where there's actually a pretty decent chunk of land. I don't think I've ever used this before. I always stay at the entrance like a goofball, or worse, try to fight him out in the middle of the lava on that tiny little island. This is way safer. And with this newfound strategy safely stored in my brain, the centipede demon goes down. You know what worries me? I'll never forget this strategy now. Like, ever. Ask me how to do long division and I'll stare at you uncomfortably, but ask me what armor and weapons you should use for a particular build, and I can write you an entire thesis. Slowly deteriorating brain functions aside, I make my way through the mac and cheese, down the slip and slide, and right into the bed of chaos. I have a sneaking suspicion that Immolation won't actually be able to damage the bed's roots, but as we learned in an earlier challenge run, you can always just roll into them and get the job done that way. Little hop skip and a jump across this gap here, and my flailing legs are enough to knock out the second root. After that, it's just a matter of rolling my way down into the center of the bed, and after a single tick of electric Immolation, the bed of chaos takes its lumps. One lord down, three to go. Back to Nito, this time with a new plan. With Havel armor fully equipped, I have enough poise to tank through all of the minion attacks and get off my three immolations. Then it's just a matter of sitting as close to Nito as possible and hoping that he does a few less AoE attacks this time around. What? I didn't say it was a good new plan. The good news is that with Bountiful Sunlight now in hand, I have more than enough casts to keep the immolation damage at bay throughout the entire fight. The bad news is that getting toxic is just a fact of life for this fight, and we're just gonna have to deal with it. But despite the odds and several angles of annoyance, our build is tanky enough to push through. 
letting us claim another Lord's soul. I'm still not quite sure what to do for Seath yet, so I'm going to pretend I have a plan for the Four Kings and push forward in that direction instead. Which means we first have to fight Sith. There's not much to see here. Sif's attacks aren't strong enough to break my poise, and once I've gotten all three emulations up and running, the only problem left is that Sif likes to keep jumping away from me. But with one cast of sunlight still remaining, that's all she wrote. Sif goes to the farm, and I'm one step closer to finishing the run. You know, I'm actually really worried about the Four Kings. Maybe it's worth trying Seath one more time. This go around, rather than trying to tank Seath's attacks, I've opted for a more hit and run approach. I hug Seath's body as tightly as I can whenever he's attacking around the arena, and always keep an eye on his hands to double check if he's about to burst with an AoE or not. In an attempt to keep him from doing said AoE blasts, I started running across his body over and over, just moving left to right and back again as many times as necessary. And while it didn't always work, it did seem to reduce the amount of times that he used the attack, which meant I spent a lot more time doing damage and a lot less time running away. And while it took every miracle I had, and a good chunk of my Estus as well, Seath the Betrayer eventually goes down. And then there was one. Well, there's nothing else for it now. Only one more boss to go before we head to even harder pastures. I plunge into the abyss, and prepare myself for the worst. And so it begins. But saving the Four Kings for last had its benefits, because all those souls I've been collecting up to this point have not been in vain, and I have just enough strength to two-hand Havel's Great Shield. With incredible defenses against every damage type, this shield will help keep me in the fight longer and safer than anything else in the game. Combine that with my Liquid Humanities, which give me an additional boost to my defenses, and we're about as tanky as we can possibly get. Except, there's a slight problem. The four kings have a grab attack that ignores my shield. What's worse, every time they grab me, they suck out my humanity, lowering my defenses even further. I hate to say it, but this boss is essentially the perfect counter to my build. They're tanky, can hit me from multiple sides, have attacks that ignore my defenses, and have other attacks that can lower my defenses even further. Combine that with the fact that there's absolutely no way in hell that I can kill each king in less time than it takes for a new one to spawn, and you've got a fight that's gone from bad to worse. But all is not lost. Despite a few hiccups and failed attempts, there just might be a chance. There has to be. Because if I can't make my current build work, no amount of grinding will make this any easier. Outside of pushing past soft caps, we're essentially at the top of this build's potential. It all comes down to skill from here. I not only have to keep calm and stick as close to a single king as I can to maximize my DPS, but I also have to remember to keep count so that I can maximize every tool at my disposal, getting as much free damage as I can. And then, after several attempts, a realization. I've gone too far. Sure, it took several tries to get the formula correct, but once I've figured it out, there's no stopping me. The four kings, destroyed with four miracles, five Estus, and one or two humanities tossed in during emergencies. Is that it? Is it really so simple? I... I guess it is. Not much left to see now. Not much further to go. I grab the last few bits and pieces left in the game, and prepare myself for the final challenge. If ever I was going to be beaten by Dark Souls, it'll be here. Let's do this. First up, the Sanctuary Guardian. With all of my poise, the Guardian has very few attacks that can disrupt my channeling, and so long as I keep it close to the entrance, the wonky angle of the ground makes it so that a good number of its attacks miss me entirely. Unfortunately, the one defense Havel's equipment doesn't have is poison, so I can't completely shut off my brain. But after using up all of my Estus, all of my regeneration, and several humanities, the fight is won. That, uh, that doesn't bode well. Time for Artorius, Knight of the Abyss. Weirdly, this fight is actually easier than most of the more recent fights we've had. Our poison defense are enough to keep him at bay, and the damage isn't terrible. The only real problem is his buff phase. When he gets that increase in damage, his attacks are much harder to tank through. I still have enough poise to get the casts off, but who baby does that damage make me nervous. However, I very quickly learn the right strategy. Just wait. It may feel wrong because I'm not doing constant damage, but it's just not worth the trade. Better to hold on to my regeneration miracles, than pop all my immolations when his attacks don't hurt so much. And so I do. And so it ends. Two down. Two more to go. I make sure that my bonfire is giving me all 20 Estus flasks, because lord knows we're gonna need them, then make my way to what is sure to be the hardest boss of the entire run, the father of the abyss himself. Phase 1 is simple enough. Just give Manus hugs, and keep that internal timer going in your head so you know when to replenish immolation. Recasting regen miracles and immolation is less about finding an opening, and more about finding which attacks will do the least amount of damage to you. Manus is a bit too aggressive and when your method of attacking is so time sensitive, we just have to accept that we're going to be taking damage this fight. Unfortunately, I made the crucial mistake of thinking that I would have enough health to survive like this, and failed to move my humanities to the top of my item list for easy access. So that first try was a bust, but that was not a mistake I would make again. 
I had to forfeit using the silver medallion, since I don't have any more room in my hotbar, but Havel's shield is able to withstand Manus' magic attacks so long as I'm facing the right direction. And with each humanity I use, my defenses get even stronger, making me more resilient as the fight goes on. It's only a matter of time, and after several hard-fought minutes, and after using every tool in my arsenal and then some, it's over. The darkness is lifted by the light of my flames, and our work here is done. So that's a mood. Honestly, after that, there's not much to be said about Calamite. Sure, he's got a grapple that lowers my defense, but it's easily avoided once you can read the tells. If anything, the hardest part of fighting Calamite is that he won't stand still. He's always flying around, and his legs have a weirdly specific hitbox that Immolation seems to struggle with. But then, I found his weakness. Turns out, Calamite has a bit of a Zoolander problem. His only option, if you position yourself correctly, is to just keep turning right, hoping to keep up with you. And you can do this pretty much forever. What a dumb way to win, I'm not even proud of this. But with Calamite embarrassed, there's only one boss left to go. The Lord of Cinder himself. Time to put that name to the test. For you were only able to burn yourself once, and that almost destroyed you. But I am able to burn myself eternal, over and over, and rise stronger for it. Go ahead, do your worst. The flames you wield are nothing in comparison to what I've endured. I've seen your kind, time and time again. Every fleeing man must be caught. Every secret must be unearthed. Such is the conceit of the self-proclaimed seeker of truth. But in the end, you lack the stomach for the agony which you've brought upon yourself.